Hello and welcome to week five of our course. Uh, this is your instructor, Professor Dragan. This week we build on our knowledge of uh, two authors that you could use for your research paper. Um, first one is Chinuai Shebe in his story, Dead Men's Past. It's a story of politics and colonialism and it's set in Africa. Second story is Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, her story, Girl, is a stream of consciousness experimental story. And you can also write on her for the research paper in the second half of the course. Um, we'll also give you help with your essay number one with a sample essay so you can look at it carefully and understand what we're expecting for your essay, which is going to be due kind of like at halftime of our course um, just before spring break on the 18th of April 18th. Okay, so looking at samples will help you understand what we're, you know, it will really help you out a lot. I hope that's a uh, a real uh, advantage of the course. I always use uh, examples from other students who've taken the course before, so you really see what other people have done. All right, so let's get started. Here I am at the website, www.latcconline.com slash at ENG102. And I'm gonna click on this week's work and get to our login page. And I'm logging in, and you should too, so hopefully you're doing this each week or figuring out a way to keep up with the course here. And here we are with uh, week five with uh, test lists here. Okay, so it's important to get to the YouTube lectures. Uh, our stats are okay, we could do better. Um, it doesn't say who viewed and who didn't, but it does say trends and analytics. Um, so our class is okay, but it could be better. So I'm hoping, well, you're already listening to this, but it's important to make time for the, the entire lecture, right? You can break it up. And if you're on the same computer, Google, um, YouTube will remember where you're at, right? Uh, there's also the table of contents on the front of each video, right? And you can click on different parts and remember to do it too that way. So yeah, let's let's do this. It's really important the second half of the course as we get to our Shakespeare. Uh, over the weekend, I um, showed my family uh, the video I used for uh, that um, in a previous course. Um, and uh, it was fun to show that to my oldest daughter. She had never seen Shakespeare before. I think she said she read some um, sonnets and stuff. But when we get to the get to that, that's brand new to us, and I'll have some good lectures, good materials from a long time just thinking about this play. Uh, so that's just a heads up there and an advertisement for that. Okay, but anyway, thank you for, you know, making time in your life for these videos. It's really important because it sets the you know, what the agenda, what we're going to do each week, and gives you a lot of advice and, and sort of expertise on what these stories are, what's in them. So you can really do better that way. It's really hard to figure it out yourself, right? All right. So here we got a sample essay for us to look at. Now we're going to look at this for a few minutes, just what's inside it, like it's, you know, how it's organized. And we'll look at um, some ideas about this so you can get a sense of it. it. Is. This yeah. is from another class from a couple of years ago. It uses different texts. Um, but it's the same idea. We just aren't teaching John Updike's A and P. That's been sort of uh, pushed aside. It has some things we probably wouldn't be interested in today. Uh, let's look at this. Um, and so somebody came up. This is uh, using the idea a thesis here. The main moral about preserving your independence can be found in both Chang Su's fable Independence and John Updike's modern short story A and P. And so we have some readings here of the, the Independence, which we read for our class. And basically, the independence of the narrator or the the, the uh, uh, Cheng Su as he offered this job from, you know, the uh, the emperor's officials, right? Here, you want a job, or you want to be free? Does he want to be free? I'd rather be this, you know, wallowing in the mud. I'd rather be alive and you know, playing in the mud and going fishing and have my own time than work like that famous three thousand year old turtle who's been you know preserved and stuck in the in the imperial i guess the imperial palace right and then that that's the first um that's the first uh, step here then we have the second step it takes uh evidence from the short story it's about a a, a young person who uh, works in a um, grocery store quits his job basically to defend the honor of somebody who comes in the store and is dissed by the manager so he actually sticks up for somebody uh, and uh, he quits his job. It's a brave thing to do, kind of a stupid thing to do, but he, he does it, and the story dramatizes us as this. Um, he quits. So I say to uh, Lengel, I quit. So here's an example of a quote sandwich. The author writes, that's the signal phrase. So I say, I quit to Lendl, quick enough for him to hear, hoping they'll stop and watch me, their unsuspected hero. 
here's the page number and site. In this quote, we see that although he thinks quitting is the appropriate action for unjust treatment of the girls, he also does it in part to be their hero, right? Uh, so there's a perfect uh, uh, quote sandwich, signal phrase, quote, site, explanation. And I want you to have a couple of these in your paper, but we can use these as examples here. All right, so this has some evidence on that, and it has an inclusion here, and it says, in conclusion, it's much more difficult to reduce a short story to a simple moral, but in order for the story to have meaning for us, there has to be a point from, to it, aside from being purely entertaining. And so we, uh, we had an extra reading here about works of fictions are ideally as opaque and ambiguous as life itself, and this writer, John Updike, was a master of short stories, um, uh, wrote a lot of stories for The New Yorker, and uh, he sort of said people would come up to him and ask, hey, in this story, what did you really mean? Could you tell us? And he said, no, I can't tell you. Read my story. I made my story to be as real as real life, which is kind of interesting, right? And we probably don't really read the, that kind of thing. We, I think with, you know, we say prestige television, I think maybe we do that, right? We have t TV that is reflects real life, and there's a lot of very textured acting and textured screenwriting. It's really the golden era of television if you're um, doing that. I don't think with Hollywood films it's as open, right? Because we have lots of comic book movies or a certain thing. But if you want to tell real stories about real people, you probably work in television if you're a screenwriter or a director today. Um, anyway, this describes this. And it's just a longer piece, Thousand Words. Let's look at some annotations here, which I posted on the regular website the, on your course documents. Okay, and here, this is an annotated version. This is some things to look at here. So a couple things that, that I noticed as a, as a professor here. Good use of evidence and quotes. Opinion, yes, but not much. There are good word choices in this writing, too. First paragraph is the introduction. It mentions the two authors and texts that are being used. And here's the thesis statement, too. Also, the person used simple transition words, like first of all, right? Discuss the fable in step one. Um, here's a good sentence, right? It's better, much better to retain one sense of purpose and freedom of doing as you please, even if it means going unnoticed. That's an opinion, an analysis, but it's disguised. He doesn't say, I think this. He just tells us. It's really good. Here's a transition word, too. Step two is discussing the short story. And again, there's some, uh, there's some judgment here and some opinion, but it's, it's just told without I, so we believe it. Updike does a great job of keeping us in Sammy's mind all throughout the story. And here's what we just saw with this really good quote sandwich, the signal phrase, the quote, the site, and the explanation. I'd like you to use that template. There are a little, there are other ones, but if you learn this one, you're good to go. You also write grammatical ones. Some of us are trying to combine the quote, the site, and the explanation. And guess what? You can read it. We kind of understand it, but it's ungrammatical. You can't just tack on a witch here or whatever. You can't, or put a comma. You got to, you got to use a separate sentence. That's what you got to do, because otherwise it's not going to make grammatical sense. Here's another one. Right? Step three, you analyze both texts. Analyze both texts. I've marked up some quote sandwiches here, too, for this. Um, and this works really well. And so what he's done is answered the three questions and also later on put an introduction and a conclusion. And this is a solid essay. So I want you to you know look at it carefully in this next online activity. All right, back at the task list here. Um, we looked at the sample essay, kind of like an overview, kind of marked it up. Now I want you to dig in with um, using some reading questions. And so we've been doing these. Um, these are uh, required, um, due on Monday, but I'm asking you to, if you turn them in on Friday, you get some extra credit. That leaves some room for the other assignment here. We've got two resets of reading questions on two readings. You'll pick one of those. So I want everyone to do this one because it's important for everybody. Everyone's going to write an essay. How's that? All right, so let's take a look at this uh, for a few. Um, and here we are with our analyzing a sample essay. And this will really help you doing this. Um, seeing an example of an assignment can help you write a successful essay for this assignment. This course will be using an example of student writing to help you write better essays. So I've been doing well with word count here. 75 words is the right amount. You put in your email, you put in your name here. Uh, we have a posting here for the essay we just saw. And we're going to walk through this for a few minutes here right? and take the parts and see what's inside this essay. Um, get started. First, skin the essay for five minutes. Look for the paragraphs where the three steps are in this essay. Step one, read a fable with short quotes. Step two, read a short story with about three short quotes or evidence. Step three, do some analysis thinking about both texts. 
See if you can develop a main idea that meaningfully compares or contrasts both stories on the areas of elements beyond plot, realism, and morals. This is the three areas that are we're using right now. His his actual thesis statement is a little bit different than ours, but it's the same idea. Look at the step one paragraph. Which fable or parables discuss? Choose one sentence that provides a detail from the source text. Now look at the step two paragraph. This sample essay uses a story which we aren't reading for our class. That's okay. Choose one quote sandwich the, or the author uses, uses for evidence and copy it out here. Is this quote sandwich correct? Does it have a signal phrase the author writes? A quote and a correct cite. Does it start a new sentence to explain the quote and connect it to the discussion? What's good or effective about your chosen quote sandwich? Remember, you want about three short quotes and cites for step two. I think this author does it and actually across uh, the last few paragraphs. Next question. Next look at the analysis here in step three, the last one. Choose one sentence to provide some analysis or critical thinking about the source story in step three. Which area does the author use for his analysis beyond plot, morals, or realism? Explain that idea in your own response in your words. Once again, try to be specific. And we have this uh, our essay map number, uh, essay map. Look at this for a few minutes. This is a good template. The idea here, you have an introduction with your main idea or thesis. Also mention your two texts. Several body paragraphs with quotes and cites for evidence and a final conclusion marked with in conclusion that would sum things up. We'll work on this shape for this essay. For essay one, the shape can be simpler, but it's a good idea to start thinking about it. Again, the one side, this is, uh, link is there, and actually it's right here, so I don't even have to do this here. I just I uh, cut it and paste it in for you to look at. Right? For number four, for the optional recommended preliminary draft, submit one or two pages due to the 20th for noon for our class. It's okay just to follow the three steps. For the full draft, due on Monday the 24th, um, after you get feedback for one or two, if you turn that in, it suggested you add an introduction and a short conclusion that follows the essay to follow the essay map above. Does this sample essay do this? Can you find a possible main idea or thesis sentence in the introduction? Copy out this main idea sentence and explain what it means. Also, is there a clear separate conclusion? Or could this be added to better fit the essay map above? Question five, last question. Find two good things about the sample essay and one suggestion for improvement. What would you like to emulate in your essay one? For instance, you could comment on the writing style, the use of quotes for the in, the in the argument, don't just say you liked it. Try to be specific in your response and say what is effective about this essay. All right? And once you submit this, you'll get, uh, we've been practicing this, uh, it's just Google Forms, Google Classroom, really. Edit your response. You'll get an edit response link, and you can change the uh, responses if you want. All right, and after you submit that, once again, this is due, like uh, the rest of the work, on uh, Monday the 8th. Uh, if you turn in a little early on Friday, you get some extra credit points. That also encourages you to get extra credit points, but also to do your work across the week. Don't wait to the very end to do everything. So not only do you benefit for the extra credit, but you benefit by pacing yourself uh, through the week, right? That's the plan here, right? All, right? All right, back at the task list here, we looked at our required work. Um, again, uh, try to take advantage of the extra credit situation. It can help you... Uh, be more successful in the course here. Okay, so we have two um, stories, and we're going to discuss both of them. I want you to read both of them, right? Both of these authors will be on our list of research paper topics coming up pretty soon, um, but um, you you want to read both of them, and you are responsible for great, uh, looking at the one set of reading questions. But we're going to talk through them both, and I hope you read both of them as well. The first one is the story of politics and colonialism, Chinua Achebe's Dead Men's Path. So we're going to click on this and look it over, just like we did before, uh, with some ideas about this story and its, its approach and uh, some of the elements here. It's a very short, compressed story, very powerful. If you or I tried to write this story, it might be 20 pages. This is about three pages, but it's super compressed and super to the point and very powerful, actually. Um, it is actually a short version of some of the themes that he covered in his much longer work, Things Fall Apart. Uh, Things Fall Apart is 1958, and it was a part of a trilogy. I used to teach T Things Fall Apart at um, Baruch as part of its Great Works program. It's a great book. I hope, sort of encourage you to pick that up if you like to read. But it plays with the same themes. This is a little bit of a tragedy, and um, 
things fall apart, it's a bigger tragedy. It's a, it's a more, it's a bigger scope and a bigger story. So let's talk about this for a few minutes. Uh, it's short. It's very compressed, and that's part of its amazingness because um, um, it allows us to engage a big question about politics and colonialism. Um, and it's just how many pages? One, two, three, like two and a half, three pages. Um, and so what happens here is this is a story of a young uh, man, Michael Obi, and he's appointed basically principal or schoolmaster of a school. He's ambitious. He has lots of energy. Uh, he's convinced he can make the world a better place. Now we know from his name and his character description, he is in between two cultures. It's clear that he is uh, African, uh, born in Nigeria, but he's educated with a British school, the British school system. So he's somebody who's adopted the colonial uh, ways from the Brits, from the British, who were, of course, the uh, colonial power during that time. Um, this is set in probably the country, not the city, in Nigeria. Um, and his wife, um, Na uh, Nancy, um, she is, um, you know, she's described a little bit too. She's interesting uh, a couple of different ways, but she kind of wants to be, you know, have, um, she says here, you know, the wives of the other teachers would envy her position. She would set the fashion and everything. Then suddenly occurred to her there may not be other wives. And so basically, oh, all our colleagues are young and unmarried. Um, so basically she isn't going to have a, a lot of friends. And that's, we kind of get her character sketched in. Interesting enough, she reads um, fashion magazines. And you know, she, that's interesting because um, what is she reading? British fashion magazines? We don't, uh, um, Ashebe doesn't tell us. So th the part of the school is, you know, school is, in, well, the school is built with, uh, you know, ha it, it's very, like, probably has a fence and it has, it's square and it doesn't recognize the original um, nature that's part of the village in this, in this story. And it has the path. And this path, the footpath, doesn't fit into the square control, the grid for the Brits. This path is sacred to the villagers in this, in this village. And they, the Brits don't trust this. The Brits see this path as, as something that doesn't fit their system. The path, the teacher said apologetically, appears to be very important to them. Although it is hardly used, it connects the village shrine with their place of burial. It has religious significance. And what has that got to do with the school, asked the headmaster. That's Michael Obi. Well, I don't know, replied the other with a shrug of the shoulders. But I remember there was a big row some time ago when we attempted to close it. That was some time ago, but it would not be used now, said Obi, as he walked away. Like, what will happen like, when we get an inspection? Right? So they close the path. They close the path. And so the village priest comes by, and he says, I've heard that you closed off our path. And look at how Michael Obi uh, treats this you know, older, distinguished religious figure, the priest, right? No, you know, we can't allow people to make a highway of our school compound. Look here, my son, son, this path was here before you were born and before your father was born. The whole life of the village depends on it. Our dead relatives depart by it and our ancestors visit us by it. But most important is the path of children coming in to be born. Mr. Obi listened with a satisfied smile on his face. The whole purpose of our school is to eradicate just such beliefs as that. Dead men do not require footpaths. The whole idea is just fantastic. Our duty is to teach your children to laugh at such ideas. Wow, that is a, a huge diss, isn't it? And just so cruel, isn't it? What you say may be true, replied the peace, but we follow the practices of our fathers. If you open the path, we shall have nothing to quarrel about. What I say, always say is, let the hawk perch and the eagle perch. Now that's a mystery. That's a proverb. Um, and and, um, and uh, this, we can kind of analyze what that means. Like, let two strong birds have their own space, right? The Brits and the villagers. Right? That's not explained. I'm sorry, but the school compound cannot be a thoroughfare. It is against our regulations. Okay? Um, and so over here, this happens. So two days later, a young woman in the village died in childbed. A diviner was immediately consulted, and he prescribed heavy sacrifices to propitiate ancestors insulted by the fence. 
Michael Obi wo woke up next morning among the ruins of his work. The beautiful hedges were torn up, not just near the path, but right around the school. The flowers trampled to death, and one of the school buildings pulled down. That day, the white supervisor came in to inspect the school and wrote a nasty report on the state of the premises, but more seriously about the tribal, quote, tribal war situation developing between the school and the village, arising in part from the misguided zeal of the new headmaster. So it sounds like Michael Obi might lose his job and his career, and you know, does he's kind of tragic in some ways, right? I mean, because he doesn't understand this. So what? We're, well, let's look at some notes to get us centered in before we turn you loose with some reading questions on this. This is such a compressed story. It's so compressed. In fact, some you'd say, well, this could be a this could be a much longer story, and guess it was. Um, let's take some notes here. Okay, here's some notes. This really became, the idea of this, of, of the conflicting values between the British and the uh, villagers became the focus of Things Fall Apart, 1950, Shabi's famous novel, uh, one of the first novels actually to depict actual life in Nigeria, authentic, not told by a Westerner. Shabi is commonly known as the father of the African novel. He just passed away a few years ago. Um, he had a long career, but this was his, you know, his groundbreaking um, uh, work and in this store and things fall apart, which I've taught at Baruch for a couple seasons. Uh, it's the same idea. You can't really, you you know, he doesn't judge. He gives us the British point of view and he gives us the villagers point of view, and he creates a, a tragic figure named Conquo, who's kind of like a warrior who had who subscribes to the old ways, but his old ways are kind of violent, and he ends up you know, hurting some people and getting banished from the village, and it's a tragedy. This this strong figure is caught in between old ways and new ways. Um, and the Brits are not figured as, as you know, colonialism is, is called out, definitely, right? It is. Uh, on the other hand, getting health care and, and, and education, um, you know, that, that's the trade-off here. So that he dramatizes and shows great respect to the values and the um, worldview of the villagers in this novel. It's a great book. I hope you, I wish we had room for it here. Uh, but here's what we have for this. The setting here is Nigeria, 1940s, in the country, not the city. Can a short story ask political questions? Can it challenge authority, show resistance, make sense of conflicting cultures? So here's some ideas about the story here. Michael Obi sort of has tunnel vision. He probably he knows modern teaching methods. He's in his 20s. He displays a clear interest in eradicating old beliefs. He's idealistic. Maybe he's a bit of a zealot. He's African educated by the British. Uh, he's smart, he's modern, right? Uh, ambitious and motivated, and, but he is stubborn, right? Educated by the British, but he doesn't show respect for the villagers' culture. He definitely disses the village uh, priest. That scene, that dialogue is so powerful. Uh, Nancy Obi is figured as being supportive. She's, she has a sort of stereotypical gender role. Um, the author writes that she would be, quote, the queen of the school. This suggests that she would com be comfortable being a community of women. Uh, she's interested in gardening, and gardens are actually a British thing. And what, what the British thought about gardens, it was in between nature and civilization. You tamed nature by making it in grids and squares, right? Nature grows wherever the hell it wants. But a garden is, is focused and controlled. The British love gardens for a long time. And Nancy uh, Obi in the story is figured as she'll have a terrific garden with flowers and all this great stuff, which is a great thing. Who would be against gardens? But Ashebi actually, there's a little bit of this in the story about, hey, the Brits are taming nature and making it regular. You can't really do that, right? Uh, what does the path represent? For the British, it represents an obstacle to the school's organization, right? And that, but it, you know, it's interesting. We put, you know, we put fences around schools, right? My kid's school up here in Washington Heights, it's got a fence around. Now they open up the fence so you can play in the weekends. Yeah, um, but it's still, if you had a, a, you know, a natural path running through your school, good luck with that. I don't think that would even play right now. It's interesting. But the footpath represents something sacred to the villagers. The priest says, let the hawk perch and the eagle perch on page 64. This is a proverb. Explain what this means. Is this too, you know, um, both are strong birds, both are predators. Um, let them, you know, it's a compromise. Let them perch and let them be strong, right? 
For the villagers, the path represents a connection to ancestors, tradition, belief, and spirituality. For the British, the path is an inconvenience. It doesn't fit the modern way. It doesn't fit the grid. It's a nuisance left over from the villagers' way of life. The village and the school can't, uh, but they can coexist. And this, according to the village priest, right? This is an argument for cultural relativism, accepting different cultures on their own terms with respect. But Michael Obie exhibits ethnocentrism, favoring British values over traditional values. He has a real lack of respect for the villagers' belief system in the conversation with the village priest, suggesting his job is to eradicate old beliefs. This is not respectful of other cultures. The twist here is that Michael is African, but has adopted the British values because of his education and becoming an educator. He's caught up in the system of colonialism. And one of the things about post-colonial theory, if you read this in graduate school, like I did, is that post-colonialism distorts not only the oppressed, of course that's true, but also the oppressor. It makes them less human as well. We'll see a little bit of this when we get to The Tempest. The metaphor of the, uh, uh, as a metaphor is a figure of speech comparing one thing to another without like or as. An extended metaphor is used to compare two things in a deeper way, not just one line. The path is really an extended metaphor for something, and it, it lets Ashebe dramatize the conflict between values here. Okay, who gets blamed for the destruction of the school building? Is this fair? Michael Obi does. Right? He, uh, he, it, maybe it's karma. Right? He had it coming. He should have listened to his own teacher in the village. Elder. Uh, possibly it's a tragic flaw, his arrogance. And the, notice the, last, the language of the last line of the story. It sounds like an official report. The ending of Things Fall Apart, which is a short but amazing novel, has the same move. It, has, it quotes an official report. It uses a shift in rhetoric. A distant official report can't capture the complexity of this story, we say the word irony, a twist in plot, a paradox, a cool, detached attitude. That word misguided zeal, describing Michael Obi's character, his over-enthusiasm. Who's a zealot, right? You don't want to be, a, probably don't want to be a ze- labeled a zealot in life, maybe not, right? He's a little bit, he's not so flexible, he's no compromise, and he's caught up in this system, all right? So that's kind of like a, a, some introduction to some key ideas of this short but powerful uh, story, we're going to turn you loose this week with some reading questions. And here they are. All right. We looked at the actual story, some thoughts on that. Um, checking it off on the task list. Now we're going to go to the reading questions. Again, these are, um, you're going to pick one set on either Shebe or Jamaica Kincaid. We'll see that in a few minutes um, as we go along. Okay. So let's look at these questions uh, for a few minutes. All right, this will also be done the 8th, um, and here's, we've been doing really well with this. Use quotes in your answers, quotes and cites. We're aiming for about two, maybe three quotes or cites in, in a set of reading questions. Not one and not eight, you know, like show that you're doing this more than once so you get some practice. Um, and again, for we've been doing really well with this, and I'm giving you feedback on your quote sandwiches. You're really getting good at this. The author writes, is a signal phrase, um, quote marks for the uh, quoted material, the quoted passage or sentence. Cite by last name and page number, and in this quote, explain what the author means in their quote. And you're getting good at this, right? If you're doing most of these uh, online reading questions, you'll really get developed a skill. Okay, you're going to fill in your uh, email and name, and we're going to look at the introduction part here in that for a few. All right. Uh, introduction. Shinua Shebe's Dead Men's Path dramatizes the conflicts around British colonialism in Nigeria, a world the author knew well. In his memoir, Shebe describes how his father, a Christian minister, had visitors of all kinds of religious beliefs in their house. The story is actually a dress rehearsal for the author's groundbreaking novel, Things Fall Apart from 1950, one of the first African novels, which established Shebe as an original and critically acclaimed author. In the story, the path represents different things to the villagers and to the British school authorities. Shebe's invention is to give us the main character who is caught between these two value systems. Michael Obi, the schoolmaster, principal is African, but he was educated in the British system. This very short, powerful story dramatizes the difficulties of politics and colonialism and makes Michael a sort of tragic figure. These themes are extended and amplified in the later novel. In only about four pages, the story sets out some important themes in Ashebe's later work. Okay, so it says 15 minutes of your story, but um, it's not, it, it, it should take you a little less than that, right? 
um, we're actually looking at the word of theme, and theme is kind of like the big picture here, right? And this lets us talk about colonialism. Okay, so question number one. Create a short character sketch of Michael Obi, the story's protagonist, our main character. Is he an enthusiastic person? What is his job? Who does he work for? Is he positive about making an impact? Also sketch out Nancy Obi. What is her attitude to her husband and his chosen career? Back up what you say with at least one short uh, quote sandwich and quote insight for evidence. And again, you've been doing well with these, and this is a chance for you to practice quoting and citing and using the kind of form of a quote sandwich. Okay, question two. Recent fiction often dramatizes conflicts when it's been explored by a lot of writers, and Achebe uh, did some groundbreaking work. So this is what uh, is in this story. What does a dead man's path represent to the colonial administration, the missionaries? What does it represent to the village? How is the path a metaphor about conflicting values? A metaphor is a figure of speech that compares one thing to something else without telling us. It's a simile uses like or as to tell us this comparison is being used. Again, use a quote in sight to back up what you say. We know the word symbol. Don't use that in college. Use metaphor instead. You'll sound so much smarter. Symbolism, that's high school. Uh, there is a kind of way to do that in college, but it's more advanced. It's actually a literary movement called symbolism, but it's from, from a long time ago. Sketch uh, number three, sketch out the character of village priest in about 20 to 25 to 50 words to explain the meaning of the path the priest says. Let the hawk perch and let the eagle perch. Tell us what this proverb means to you in the scheme of the story. Also, is Michael Obi respectful to the traditional values and beliefs represented by the village priest? Does his tone in Obi's answer surprise you? In this conflict, can a reader know who's right? Why or why not? How does Ashebe take sides? How can you tell? How can you tell? He... he Makes Michael Obi into a bit of a jerk here, doesn't he? In only a few words and, and sentences. Challenge questions. Last question here. Um, take a look at the ending of the story. In the ending, who is blamed for the destruction of the school building? The whole school wasn't torn down. Now, in the things fall apart, the, the uh, reaction of the villagers to the um, is much more violent in some ways. And this is a dress rehearsal for that. Why is Michael Obi lost? How has why has Michael Obi lost his promising career running a school? Is this fair? Is it tragic because it's ca caused by conflicting cultural forces that no one seems to control? Remember, Michael Obi is between cultures. He's African, but was educated in the British system, where he learned a different set of beliefs. Also, look at the language of the last sentence of this piece. How is the tone? or word choice different than the rest of the story. Once again, anchor what you say with one direct quote in sight from the ending of the story for evidence. All right, so this gives you a chance to think a little bit about the ending. We looked at, you know, in the, anytime you're reading a story, the endings are really important. That's where meaning gets created, right? We, that's where it is. It's not the beginning, not the middle. It's at the ending. That's where you kind of play detective, meaning detective, to find out what's going on. And that's going to be in the ending of the story. So that's a good place to look. All right, so again, you're going to get um, uh, an edit your response link. You can look over your answers. If you save that link, you can edit it later. Otherwise, it's sent in, and we can uh, make some progress on this story. Okay, after you uh, submit that, um, again, to be clear on the deadline, it's the 8th. Uh, we're going to be kind of repeating ourselves, but that's the plan here to keep it clear. All right, so now it's time to look at our probably the most experimental story that we're going to see all season. That's Jamaica Kincaid's Girl. This is a story written in a different style than most stories. We've covered realism in a, a bunch of stories now, right? Now it's time to see how we can go beyond realism in a very clear way, the way this is written. Okay, so let's. All right, some. now it's actually uh, we're going to see the the original version of Jamaica Kincaid's story as it was published in a magazine called The New Yorker. In 1978, this is a good segue or transition into our research paper. One of the top a couple of the research paper topics invite you to look at a story as it was published in this magazine in the original a long time ago. You don't have to do that. That's an extra credit topic. But we introduce today something called material culture. Material culture is like the actual thing in in history, right? Not just on the internet with no history. This is like a magazine issue from 1978, decades ago. So just to check it out, this is like, you know, enrichment as well, but it gives you a contest to think historically about some of these authors who have been around for a long time. All right, so let's take a look at this in, in the magazine to start that conversation. Okay, so here's this uh, magazine issue. We won't do much with this except for enrichment and a little bit of a context here. Um, 
you know, this is a, from 1978, the New Yorker magazine. New Yorker is still around. Uh, it's a progressive uh, magazine. Um, the other room right now, my uh, spouse is working in Architectural Digest, running um, their global empire. Uh, part of Condé Nast, it's a very successful magazine. It makes piles of money. People love the New Yorker and have for a long time. Um, it, I used to, I kind of used to make fun of it with people, you know, on the subway clutching their New Yorker, like why is it in print? And you, you see this even now. Uh, I, I don't go on the subway a lot um, lately, but uh, it has fashion, has culture, and you know, upper middle class people aspire to this. And look at this, it's fun to see old, you know, ads for technology, right? I mean, I guess you could be into vinyl and have an old school, um, you know, turntable. But anyway, all this stuff happening, ads for alcohol cars, you know, that's how they make the money with advertising. Um, you know, not so diverse, like look at these characters. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there is a, there is a sense of, of society changing in this. Uh, cartoons, there are a lot of cartoons here. Um, and by famous uh, artists, um, don't have to go through it too much, but uh, if you're a New Yorker cartoonist, you've made it, you really have. So here's, here's what we got. Um, there's, they're in the middle, tucked in the middle of this sort of non-diverse magazine issue of 1978 is a one-page story by Jamaica Kincaid. You know, that's all you get. You don't get any context for her, who she is. And um, here it is. Wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. Wash the color clothes on Tuesday and put them on the clothesline to dry. Don't walk barehead on the hot sun. Cook pumpkin fritters in very hot, sweet oil. Soak your little cloths right after you take them off. When buying cotton to make yourself a nice blouse, be sure it doesn't have gum on it, because that way it won't hold up well after a wash. Soak salt fish overnight before you cook it. Is it true that you sing Benna in Sunday school? Always eat your food in such a way it won't turn someone else's stomach. On Sundays, try to walk like a lady. Right? So there is a lot of rules here. Right? And a little, there's a couple moments where we see another voice here. And that's the daughter's voice. This is probably a mother giving advice. Right? And here's the pushback from the daughter. I, but I don't sing Ben on Sundays at all. I'm never on Sunday school. It's a little bit of her here, right? And, uh, and at the end, and she, all these rules. Now, why are you know, these rules are very much containing cultural information about living, you can figure it out, in an island culture maybe, um, you get the sense that these are domestic rules, gender expectations, and you know it's not like how to start a business or how to go to medical school. It's practical information that fits the culture. Jamaica Kincaid has captured this for us and gives a strong sense of personality of this mother figure. Only in, in the margins are, is the voice of the girl, even though it's called girl. It's really about the mother. Right? There's an interesting formal choice here. If you count up how many sentences there are in this piece, guess how many sentences there are? Well, guess what? Every single sentence gets a semicolon. Every single sentence. There's only one sentence in this entire piece. This is a giant sentence. How about that, grammatically? So Jamaica Kincaid, very smart writer. She actually, she worked in art direction, the art department at The New Yorker when she started out. Um, knows her cultural history. And I want to show you, just for enrichment, a famous, famous version of this that came about, you know, 60 or so years earlier. And this is over here. And this is just for enrichment, but this is my favorite book in the world. I've spent a lot of hours working on it, thinking about it, reading it. I've read it, you know, five or six times. It's a 600-page book. I've read different editions. I've traced it. It was published in a little magazine called Little Review in the 19-teens and 20s, and I actually took a whole copy of that. And it was me in graduate school. I was up at Columbia spending quarters and dimes copying from microfilm. Um, this um, novel and other things around this magazine. Can you imagine? Now you can get that online. I actually have a CD of it now. Um, but anyway, Ulysses was written by an Irish writer named James Joyce. It was an experimental or modernist piece of writing. In the story, the end it ends with a character named Molly Bloom, whose secret name is Penelope, and that's from uh, from Ulysses, or the Odyssey by Homer. Um, she is the um, spouse of Odysseus, who's away at war for 18 years. He can't get home after the war. Uh, in her, This story is her thoughts here, and so you can read a little bit, but it's all one giant sentence, and it's beautiful, really. Is. I won't 
you want to read it out loud to yourself, there's all these great sentences, right? And it's all one sentence. It's a, uh, a woman who is just thinking out loud about her life, and this is actually the end of the novel. Um, and uh, it talks about her meeting her husband, and it has been a complicated day. Uh, in a 600-page novel, this is the end. The last 20 pages have no periods here, just one giant run-on sentence. And this is definitely experimental. So this is just FYI, uh, but it's clear that in the mix, uh, anyone who writes short stories and knows about experimental fiction knows about James Joyce and this uh, story, even if they haven't read it all the way through. And again, I've spent time as a scholar uh, on it. And um, every time I reread it, I find something new in it. It's that kind of a book. So for some context of Jamaica Kincaid's Girl, we have the, her book, her book version of this. And the book version is the same story, but it's just three pages. And we saw in the magazine, it's one page. So it isn't much to read, but it's, it's powerful. It's experimental. It's one sentence. It's one big, beautiful, lyrical sentence, right? It has just a character thinking out loud. And it's actually um, complicated because we can't really, you know, we can't really say exactly who's saying this. this is, obviously, if the girl and the mother are walking around town, she, she isn't saying this out loud. That would be insane. Maybe it's the daughter remembering her mother's voice after she left her native country, came to New York City, and is recalling the powerful figure imaginatively that's almost in her subconscious of her mother. Maybe that's it, right? And if that's why I've heard scholars talk about this who are experts in Jamaica Kincaid, and the answer is no one really knows. No one really knows uh, what exactly the the framework here, but it's clear that this is a voice and creating this voice is part of the power and success of this and got Jamaica Kincaid from the art department of the New Yorker to being a famous author on the pages of the New Yorker and that almost never happens. You don't, you don't join the staff of the New Yorker to become a writer at the New Yorker. I mean, unless you're hired as a writer, um, you are, you know, you're there to do something else, right? Okay, so we have, it's only three pages, but it's a voice and a writer that you can use. We have the whole collection to use here. I've chosen a second story for you. If you like this, you can work on Girl plus this other story uh, from the same collection. We'll just put a, you know, PDF and let you uh, analyze it with some ideas. And the idea is this is experimental, okay? So, you know, it's only three pages. I hope you read it and appreciate it. It's the last short story that we're going to do in this version of the course. There's some other writers we plan to put on, but we don't have room for, and that always happens. Uh, we, don't, we aren't going to do um, Borges this season or Hemingway or Cheever, but we have enough, and we'll have about 10 sample topics to use for your research paper on the different authors that we've covered. All right, after talking about the story for a few and even in the magazine, uh, you've re you'll read it. Read it to yourself, right? And we're going to work through these questions. And to be clear, we want um, one set of questions only, either on Achebe or Kincaid. If you turn in both, I'll take the one that you turn in first, uh, and you'll get credit for that. You don't, don't do two. That's too much. I'm more interested in you digging in and analyzing a sample essay. That's more critical to your success in this class because that's really going to help you write that first paper. You can write the second paper, maybe in even the final exam on a Shebe and Kincaid. So they're valuable for us to read, uh, but you won't might necessarily write on both of them. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so now let's look at the um, reading questions for a few minutes. Um, and again, same idea. And as we've been saying, things are due on the 8th for this. Um, and again, we're using the same approach. It should be about equivalent in difficulty, right? Um, you know, it's tr probably true that this is a little more challenging just because it's a more challenging story. But here's how we cite it, right? The author says, uh, quote, and we cite Kincaid's last name, page 66, uh, parentheses and period here. And this quote explains the quote a little bit, right? So you're going to again fill in and let's discuss this a little bit with stream of consciousness. There's some background on this for a little bit. In Jamaica Kincaid's Girl, the author uses as a technique called interior monologue or stream of consciousness to let us hear the inner voice of two thoughts, um, the inner thoughts of two characters, a mother and daughter in Antigua. That's her native um, place of birth in the Caribbean. In this short piece, the mother gives her daughter many rules for living, which contains cultural information and rules and expectations for gender and behavior. 
This is an experimental piece which is lyrical and beautifully written. You can use this piece along with an, another Kincaid short story written in a similar style for the upcoming research paper if you want. Okay, so um, there are one or two thorny word choices the mother uses for her daughter here. Just a, a warning, but if you can read it, if you read it out loud, you'll get a better sense of the piece here. And it's posted uh, as, they all, as the readings here are uh, on here. Uh, and you can read it for yourself. Uh, and then our, our questions here are inviting you to understand this piece with some context. First, do a search of stream of consciousness on Wikipedia and Google. Give us a definition of this style of writing using a direct quote in sight from your online source. Give us one fact about stream of consciousness writing from your source. For example, the correct site for a Wikipedia article on stream of consciousness is stream of consciousness in quotes. You may use this article or another one. I just put the link here, uh, stream of consciousness. So that would be a way to solve this. And you'll see one of the writers is James Joyce. I forgot his middle name was Analicious. <laughs> um, and it has this, some overview of this, including you know this book here. It was called The Big Blue Book of Eckley Street. It, was, it had a blue cover. Um, it was censored, by the way. It was a censored book for a, long, for a while. Um, anyway, uh, it doesn't, I don't know if it mentioned, it doesn't mention, um, doesn't really mention uh, Jamaica Kincaid here, but it doesn't have to because many writers have borrowed this and she did too, this idea of using it. So, you know, just some facts about it. Just pick a fact. This is good practice for starting our research paper process. We will not be using Wikipedia, okay? We're not going to be using Wikipedia. Please do not use Wikipedia, but for learning about things, Wikipedia is just fine. It's just not good for college papers because a lot of professors hate it. And of course, it's lazy research because it's the first thing that pops up in Google. You're not going to use Google. We're going to use the responsible library databases, two of them, and I'll show you how to use those next week. But for now, this is fine. All right, so that's the first question, though, to practice a little bit, you know, getting a sight and getting in your head, hey, the stream of consciousness. The other way to talk about it is interior monologue. That's another thing. Okay, number two, how is Jamaica Kincaid's girl an example of stream of consciousness writing? Who is speaking? Whose thoughts are being recorded for us in this story? Give us one quote on sight for one or two rules that the speaker is giving us in this, in giving in this story. What kind of rules are presented? You know, is it what you know? How can you categorize these rules? I mean, they're about you know cleaning, cooking, behaving. You know, again, it's not about studying for your SATs and you know or whatever. Right? Interesting. Of course, it's it's linked to a particular culture and place, and it's linked to Jamaica Kincaid's own personal conflict with her mother. I think. I think the mother is not is she's tough and she's beautifully created, but she's very tough on her. Uh, teenage daughter, I think, in the story. Also, there anything about the story that's experimental? For example, how many sentences are in this story? How is this experimental? Okay, question three. What kind of character is being created in this set of rules? And girl, what did you learn about the mother in this story? Is she knowledgeable about her culture? Where does she live? What is the family's economic or social status? How can you tell? Is the mother demanding towards her daughter? Is there a sense of conflict developed between the mother and the daughter here? There are only hints of this, but I think it's there. How can you tell? Anchor your response with one quote in sight for evidence from the reading. Okay, again, we're practicing our quotes in sight using quote sandwiches so you're familiar with them for the formal essays, essay one, essay two, and essay three, the final exam. Challenge questions. Look at the ending of the story. And it's, again, this is like a mystery. And I've heard like, you know, scholars from around CUNY talk about this at a conference once. And they were really, they were really said, we don't, don't really know exactly when this story is recorded, right? It's, it's like almost like a dream, isn't it? That's what makes it experimental. Look at the ending of the story. Who wins in the struggle between the mother and the daughter? How can you tell? Speculate on the resolution in this story. How is the conflict between the mother and daughter resolved? Or is it more open-ended, like many modern short stories? Cite evidence for your interpretation with one quote in sight from the ending of this piece. You are the interpreter or critic here. It's up to you to read between the lines and discover what this ending means. It's not, it's not so obvious. And you can ask yourself, God, why did this get published? Because it's beautiful, right? It's powerful. It's original. It represents a world that did not fit the sensibilities of The New Yorker in 1978. It, there was nothing like this around, and uh, you know, uh, 
the achievement of Jamaica Kincaid is to bring uh, a world into view for for people, uh, and also you know a culture, and also ideas about gender. Okay, and that's what she achieves in this three-page story. That's, that's a lot, and that's why this story got famous very quickly. It's been around for a while, and it's been successful for a while. We still read it today. Again, that's due on the eighth uh, if you're keeping score. All right, all right. So again, to be super clear, we want to you know read you know, read both stories, get them in your in your brain. Um, engage them, think about them. You might decide to write on one or the other for the upcoming research paper, uh, essay number two. You might decide, um, although most students will write on the Tempest for the final exam, there will be a question on the short stories moving beyond realism. And actually, Kincaid works really well for that. So maybe that's the issue. Okay, so now it's time for our discussion board post for this week. This should be pretty easy. I mean, I'm talking about favorites, pretty easy. Your favorite story so far Realism versus the imagination, two core themes here that we've been looking at a little bit. All right, so here it is. Um, this is our form for week five, and this will be due on the eighth as well with all the other work this week. You can write a little bit more here, but 150 words minimum. Please answer some of these questions in your post. For the next two um, plus weeks, you're revising and finishing a draft of essay one, which will have you compare one of the short fables and parables to one of our longer stories. Uh, you probably not are not going to write that essay on Eshebi or Kincaid, which you just covered, but they're included here. The, here's the links to the stories we've read so far and the breakdown of that. In a post about 150 words, select one of these stories and answer a few of these questions. What is your favorite story you've read for so far in class and why? Is the story more about realism or is it more about the imagination? How can you tell? Is this kind of story you usually enjoy, either in movies or TV or books? If you usually enjoy stories that are more about the imagination, what was good about this realistic story? If you prefer realism, what was realistic about this story? What made it real to you? Um, in your post, besides answering a few of these questions, give us some evidence with an effective line of writing that you found to be original, effective, or appealing. And use a site for that if you could. Okay, give us a quote. Do a quote, sa a quote sandwich, right? Practice that. Give a one-sentence quote for evidence and a correct citation for full credit. Answering this post carefully will help us reflect on course themes of the imagination versus realism as we get ready for the Tempest for the second half of the course. This play, it's a graphic novel version, has both kinds of storytelling in its DNA. All right? You've been doing well with this. Avoid text speak. Use capitalization, full sentences. Use chunking to break up your post into smaller pieces so we can read it better. You'll get used to this. You'll have more engagement with social media, I promise. All right. So that's going to be due on the 8th as well. And we're about done with uh, this talk. Okay. So here we are. We finished our discussion board post. Uh, we'll have our usual virtual office hour. Um, it's on 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. on two Mondays. Um, we also have a mini one on Wednesday, 9.30 to 10.30. Drop by for a few minutes. There's the Google Meet link. And you can get a question answered. You don't have to be there for very long. Just come by for five minutes. Happy to answer your questions and help you out. All right, so we're getting close to the you know, halfway point of the course. We're not quite there yet. And we're asking you to you know, do some work to get help yourself out with looking at a sample essay, reading two more stories, which I promise are popular for the second half of the course uh, for our research paper and even the final exam. So we are building our knowledge for things that will be useful you, for you in this course. All right, so thank you so much for your work in the class so far. Keep going, we're, we're in a good place. We could do a little better, but we're, we're in a solid place as a class. Okay, have a great week. Thanks for listening. Take care.